Hey everyone, it's Jesse. I just wanted to jump in before this episode starts to give a quick update. The first segment of this episode involves a controversy at the New York Times over a column published by Senator Tom Cotton. After we finished recording the episode, the Times issued a mea culpa in which a spokeswoman said that the column was a result of, quote, a rushed editorial process, end quote, and that the op-ed, quote, did not meet our standards, end quote. Katie and I believe the episode you're about to hear holds up completely as is, in part because the Times has not produced any examples of anything that was factually inaccurate in the Cotton column, in part because the Cotton camp is strongly denying the claim of a rushed or unusual process, and in part because our conversation was just as much about the internal dynamics of the Times as the content of the column itself. That said, we'll discuss these more recent developments in an upcoming episode, as well as the controversy within the controversy over Times Opinion staffer Barry Weiss, which also took place too late for us to get it into this episode. Reality, in short, is exhausting right now. Check out the show notes for some resources that are up to date as of the morning of Friday, June 5th. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoy the episode. And please forgive my mic issues, which will not happen again. Katie, how's it going? Oh, you know, Jesse, pretty good. Just trying to figure out what's true today and what's not, you know, as usual. This can be very challenging. There was one issue I was hoping to address with you about the show, if that's all right. Oh, yeah. So I had a really nice call with my dad today. Hi, dad. I hope you're listening. Hi, Jesse's dad. <laughs> and he said something like, he really likes the show, but he can't help but wince when he hears me swear. <laughs> Typical dad. Typical dad. Typical dad. But I love him. I don't want to cause him undue stress. Here's what I'm thinking. Obviously, a major reason we have an audience is because we swear and swearing is cool, right? Fuck yeah. I don't want to reduce the total amount of swearing. But if I reduce mine to close to zero and you approximately double yours, we can keep the total quantity of cursing constant while I can appease my father. Does that make sense to you? I mean, shit pussy fuck yes, it does. Okay, this is great. We will call this the shit pussy fuck accord. <laughs> well, I hope your dad is happy with this compromise. Uh, I think he will be. I love you, dad. Katie, I have a question for you. Sure. What's the name of this podcast? Blocked and Reported. You're listening to Blocked and Reported. I'm and I'm Katie Herzog. And I'm Jesse Single, constantly stepping on my co-host as I just did. Uh, today we have, I think what we could describe as an all-times episode of Blocked and Reported, not in the sense that it will be particularly good, because I do not think it will be, but it is basically entirely about the New York Times. Lucky you. Yeah, lucky you. So we're also going to be sticking around and doing a patrons-only episode about, I guess you could call it, what, performative Instagram slacktivism? Yeah, uh, Instagram bullshit. That's what I would call it. Right. So we'll switch from media bullshit to Instagram bullshit for our patrons. We appreciate our patrons. We're at patreon.com slash blocked and reported. You can also rate and review us on po Apple Podcasts. Uh, what else we got? Email blocked and reported podcast at gmail.com and Twitter at the bar pod. Oh, check out our subreddit, uh, blocked and reported subreddit. And I guess that's it for housekeeping and we should, we should get right into it. Yeah. So yesterday the Times published a column by, by Tom Cotton. And the basic point of the column was to argue that that the uh, troops should be sent in to, to quell what Cotton views as the violence and rioting and looting going on in some cities. Cotton argues that under the Insurrection Act, Trump can basically override states that don't want federal help. So the column is partly arguing for the idea of like the National Guard working in sort of a helper or supplementary role with local authority. But he's also pretty clearly saying that he thinks Trump should be able to just sort of steamroll a given governor and and you know, impose troops on a city where there's violence, uh, a Bruin. So this column launched an immediate firestorm, particularly among New York Times staffers. And it was described as an insurrection where a bunch of staffers, dozens of them, I believe, all tweeted basically the same tweet, which said that printing this column put Black journalists in danger. And the subsequent conversation was sort of framed by that. It, it became less about the pros and cons of the column and more about this idea that the paper had committed this really serious potential harm by running it, right? So the specific tweet that started showing up all over Twitter by New York Times staffers was running this puts black New York Times staff in danger. So, I mean, the funny thing about this to me is that like, for one, like this, this tweet, like seeing it over and over again, 
by these st- by these staffers like made it seem like for a moment that they'd all caught the same brain worm or that someone had hacked their account and made them all post the same tweet. It turns out no, this was like uh, you know like a, a a gesture of solidarity and not a parasite in their brains. But um, there was also this you know journalists and like we are totally guilty of this. Like we spend most of our time talking and bitching about journalists ourselves but just there's this immediate impulse to make it about journalists yeah totally i mean it 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 immediately becomes this sort of like middle school lunchroom thing where where people on one side racing to show that they're on the right side of this and i there are people i know at the time so i have a lot of respect for who tweeted this and and like i don't know what to tell you because i actually agree that I, i wouldn't have given at times online opinion page slot to Tom Cotton, who can get his message out however he wants. But that's a different question from whether to say that publishing a column puts journalists at risk, especially when this is the outlet that published Vladimir Putin and the literal Taliban. Mm -hmm. Um, And published Hitler in 1941. (laughs) I mean, I'm not kidding, like published fucking Hitler. (laughs) Right. Why did these time staffers not complain when the Times published Hitler? Right. Do better. (laughs) Um, I, this is what I got snared on. Uh, so the problem is, if you want to make the case that the Times shouldn't have used this space, given it to Tom Cotton, that's one thing. If you want to argue that he got factual things wrong, that's another thing. And most of the claims on that, like people sort of claim that the, the column was full of factual errors. I think mostly it was things like he, in many people's minds, exaggerated the role of Antifa. And he like he referenced one issue where people participating in riots seem to have fancy cars, but that was like, he, he leaked to them. So that was like one tweet. There was this great line in it. Some, so he's talking about here, he's talking about looters. He's not actually talking about protesters here. I mean, he like makes a distinction. He writes, bands of looters rove the streets, smashing and emptying hundreds of businesses. Some even drove exotic cars. <laughs> yeah, I was imagining Tom Goddard be like, the streets filled with looters who were super handsome and listening to awesome music. Yeah, it was like uh, Fast and the Furious. <laughs> smoke doobies. Um, yeah, so the piece basically... It is hard to read the piece and come up with a coherent explanation of how the difference between black journalists' lives being endangered and not endangered is this piece being published in the Times. I just, this is, these online debates drive me crazy because like we're not, it's like this becomes the focus of it because this is the argument the Times staffers went with to to criticize their employer. But that doesn't strike me as realistic. I would much rather have a conversation over the actual merits of the column and what it really said. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this sort of reminded me of the the blow up over the, the first Brett Stevens column, where the dialogue online was that Brett Stevens denied. He wrote something that was basically like critical of environmental um, activists. And the narrative that got pushed online was that the, the Times had hired a climate change denier. And when you read Stephen's column, like he clearly says that he believes the science between behind climate change. Like he doesn't, he's not a climate change denier. He doesn't think it's a hoax. He's not Donald Trump. Um, and he, and he like laid that out very clearly. But the narrative that spread was just like, was just not based in reality. And that's kind of how I felt about the, the Tom Cotton column. I mean, basically what he's saying is that they should send in national troops to protect these cities against like rioters and looters. That's not something I'm in favor of. I think what they need to do is like fucking deescalate. But a lot of people have pointed out that like, A, he's not talking about peaceful protesters. And of course, there's like a lot of people have been equivocating peaceful protesters and, and people who are actually destroying cities, which is happening. And this isn't to say that what the cops are doing right now isn't worse. Like, the videos that we've been seeing of police brutality are truly, truly insane and like fucking nightmares. Nightmares. But I've also seen people who like actually know about criminal justice and the military say that, you know, the National Guard might actually be able to respond better in these instances because they're actually trained. I don't know how much I really trust that because like we've also heard nightmare stories of like, you know, soldiers like committing horrible acts of brutality overseas. But I also don't think that the people who are like automatically assuming that this is going to put specifically black journalists in danger. And I'm not sure why, sure why they like pointed out black journalists and not just say like put people in danger. You know, like right. why are journalists like why elevate journalists and why not say like they're putting the American public in, in danger by putting soldiers on the streets? 
Well, because they wanted to say something that would force their employer. Right. Puts their employer in a little bit of a, a difficult position, right? Yeah, and it uh, absolutely worked. It does put their employer in a, in a difficult position. It, it's interesting to think about. Um, I am completely opposed to the military being deployed the way Cotton suggests, especially against the wishes of states. Oh, yeah. That said, it, it isn't clear to me that if you replace police who fucking suck at de-escalation, sorry, Dad, I swore, who freaking, <laughs> if you replace police who suck at de-escalation um, with National Guard troops, with National Guard or, or any branch of the military, like, it's true what you said, that they commit atrocities, but they commit atrocities in war zones. Right, I, I actually right. think they're probably better trained. I also think the... Tom Cotton sort of overstated the extent of some of the rioting and looting. And I think it's like pretty opportunistic. And these are not people who, if the, if the military showed up, they wouldn't be like, yeah, I'm going to fight the military. I think they would go home. But the only reason we're even like really debating that is because of this claim that it would put black journalists lives at risk. And I, I think it, it's just complicated. Also, so the other thing we should note is um, I'll read directly from, from Cotton's column here. Not surprisingly, public opinion is on the side of law enforcement and law and order, not insurrectionists. According to a recent poll, 58% of registered voters, including nearly half of Democrats and 37% of African Americans, would support cities calling in the military to, quote, address protests and demonstrations, unquote, that are in, quote, response to the death of George Floyd, end quote. So I looked into those numbers and it's true. Like even 37% of African Americans are in favor of a military presence in the city. It's not apples to our apples because what Cotton is calling for is for the federal government to do it, even if states don't want to. And the survey question was not phrased in that way. It was phrased more in like, would you be cool with the military supplementing and helping out local authorities? But either way, the point is there's no way to slice the numbers in which Cotton is expressing a, a, a far, far right fringe opinion. And seeing mainstream journalists not grapple with that fact, I think is another problem here because there are a lot of opinions that we might find dangerous or distasteful that are held by a lot of Americans. And I don't think it's the place of an editorial page to draw the boundaries that narrowly. Jesse, are you suggesting that the New York Times staffers might be out of touch with the American public? You know, I would never suggest anything like that. I think uh, Times staffers tend to be salt of the earth types. Uh, I know they're, a lot of coal miners who... <laughs> they're, they're flyover people. They really are. Um, you know, I, I think that's a good point. And I, one thing that's frustrating to me about this is that after the 2016 election, it, which was such a shock to everybody in, like, on the left and everybody in mainstream media that Donald Trump actually fucking won, I thought that there would be this sort of recalibration where people would realize, oh, like people like us, people in the media would realize like, oh, we're deeply out of touch with the American public. We need to, to we need to change that. We need to change that. But instead, there's been the opposite thing has happened where when people do do things like go try to interview Trump supporters, they're called racist, you know, for profiling Trump supporters, even the act of like platforming these people who are, you know, unfortunately had the majority vote in the country or didn't actually have the majority vote in the country, but actually, you know, got this guy elected. The, the like even engaging with them is considered somehow problematic and it's just it's like very terrifying to me that people didn't learn this lesson after 2016 the other thing is like i i saw andrew sullivan tweeted a little bit cryptically that his column in new york magazine which i think would usually appear tomorrow friday probably the day most of you are listening to this just just won't be appearing he didn't provide any other details there aren't any details part of what worries me about all this is be, like. I know some people at the Times who really disagree with this approach to journalism and where the boundaries should be drawn. And they, in fact, are not really in a position to say this publicly. I suspect the Sullivan situation has something to do with like that same. I mean, when you were at The Stranger, you sort of had to worry about what, what younger, more radical staffers would say about your work, right? Is that something you can talk about? I would like to say that the potential for pushback, both within, side, both within and outside the building, didn't influence what I chose to report on, but it absolutely did. And in part, it's just because it's really uncomfortable to feel like everybody around you doesn't like you. You know, um, 
it is. And like, you know, actually when we like, you know, started, when we started quarantine, it was like, oh great, I get to work from home. Like I won't have to deal with people like ignoring me in the hallways. Um, and then of course I got laid off. So that blissful situation didn't, didn't work out. For very long. <laughs> There's just this, like what I've been experiencing right now and what I imagine is happening at the times and is this like extreme pressure to conform. Right. I've never experienced anything like this. And, and I'm like, this is, I'm isolated, you know, like the world might have stopped quarantining, but I'm still quarantining, which is another thing that uh, we should probably talk about at some point. This like weird revisionist history where all of a sudden, like, it's okay to leave your house after fucking three months of not leaving your house if it's a good cause. Um, oh, it's very disturbing. So I feel like I, I'm experiencing this like great pressure to conform, not because of things that people are saying to me directly, but just because it's everywhere, right? It's everywhere. The, like the zeitgeist, like this is the message. We right. have one message now. It is protest good. You don't have to stay, like quarantine is over if you're protesting, you know, just this like total revisionist history. And just the pressure to be a part of that is just immense. It really is. And I keep getting emails from people. I've gotten more messages from people in the past like four days than I have probably in the past year of people just saying like, I feel totally alone. Everybody that I know is on this bandwagon and I don't know how, I don't know what to do. If I don't, I'm afraid that if I don't go to a march or if I don't post, if I don't post the meme or whatever, people are going to think that I'm, that I'm racist or I, you know, I'm in favor of police brutality that I, you know, don't support, don't support this movement or whatever. It's yeah. wild, wild. And so I'm sure that that's also happened within the times. Like, can you imagine being the time staffer who doesn't post that fucking tweet? Well, that was what I was thinking of. Cause like, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but like there's one staffer in particular who I think is really, he's the last person I would expect to believe that like one column in the times makes the difference between life and death or at least, at least life endangerment. You know, and he tweeted too. And I think the way it works is like there's a Slack channel or something, or there's sort of internal communications. And why would you possibly want to be the guy who refuses to tweet something, you know, that touches on something as horrible as the idea of a journalist being murdered? And that's that's the brilliance of that sort of framing is people can have good faith agreement about about the use of the Times platform or, or Cotton's actual arguments. You can't have a good faith argument over whether or not black journalists should be murdered. I mean, it's just, it's so far beyond what the column called for. And I saw a lot of professional journalists. And again, like we keep being forced in this situation where we're sort of defending some aspect of something we fundamentally disagree with. I fundamentally disagree with the column. I thought he, he pointed to some truly horrible violent incidents that have happened. I think overall the, the rate of violence, given how much upheaval there's been, has been pretty low, which is another reason not to bring in the military. Um, there's no way to quantify this, but it seems like the police are being as violent in some places in some places police are like marching with protesters but when i watch like what's happening out of like the, the nypd i mean it and and it there has also been like massive property destruction which uh nicole hannah jones from the new york times like she was interviewed recently and she said something like um you know property uh, property destruction isn't violence it's interesting now that words are violence but property but like literally like destroying someone's business isn't violence and i find that just like so incoherent like you know what? People need to make a fucking living, especially people who have been out of business for the past couple months. And then this just like destruction of it's not just destruction of property. It's the destruction of their livelihoods. I think it's deeply fucked up. But I also think like NYPD's response to this, especially from just and I'm not there. I don't know the whole story, but it looks like their response to this has just been like fucking horrific. I mean, just like beating people for no reason. I saw there's a, a reporter for Tablet whose name I'm forgetting now. NYPD stole his bike yesterday. Did you see this? They just like they stole his fucking bike. I mean, the there's a ridiculous video out of Kansas City that I newslettered about where like this dude is just he's he's yelling at the police, but in a calm, controlled way. He's you know saying they're cowards that they are shooting people unjustly. He's making all these like perfectly normal points and they just fucking storm him and mace this woman who tries to, tries to protect him and drag him out in the streets. And it's just, the police are so clearly, I, I don't want to like debate the percentage of good cops versus bad cops. That's not the point. There's clearly a subset of them who are completely fucking out of control and who, who don't know how to handle protests, don't know how to deescalate. It's terrible. And, and I, you know, I think the, 
these protests are, are proving that in what is, in a morbid sense, a useful way. But I, I guess what I'm saying is it's, there's a very particular style of rhetoric where you can't argue over whether or not a column should have been published because then you're arguing people should die. And and when I, I'm thinking of one example, um, there was a blow up at Wesleyan University about someone publishing a, a mildly anti-Black Lives Matter column that wasn't even against BLM per se, but it was just sort of making some arguments against certain aspects of the movement. This caused a major blow up at Wesleyan, whatever, they're college kids. I was considering writing about it and I reached out to them and they sent me this completely incoherent statement that basically made it sound like what was at stake here was life and death. If someone wrote a slightly critical column about BLM in the Wesleyan Argus or whatever it was, that's a matter of life and death. And if you told me that a few years later, like professional journalists of the Times would have adopted that same style of discourse, I'm not sure I would have believed you. And I, I don't, there's nothing, you know, you or I or the many other people disturbed about this can can really do because you'll sort of quickly get piled on as not getting it. And people aren't interested in sort of debating or talking about the actual column. It's just like either you agree that it was fascist propaganda that causes imminent danger to black journalists in particular, who, again, I do not view as the first people who would be killed if there was like a military uprising. Um, if you disagree with that, you're part of the problem. End of discussion. And I don't think that's a way to have conversations about what journalism should be. It's just it's weird to me that people are journalists, especially are condemning the paper and not the op-ed itself. Like this really does take away from the content of, of what Tom Cotton wrote. I mean, people are talking less about what he actually wrote than they are the fact that it was published. And I just don't see the point of that. I mean, and then there's this other element where people, and I've seen a lot of people who I sort of get along with and, and somewhat respect saying on Twitter that they canceled their New York times subscriptions because of this column. And I just find that so funny because like, if you support, if you're doing this because you support the journalists of the New York times, you support their journalism, you want to support black journalists in particular. And so what you're going to do is make it harder for them to do their jobs by taking your financial support. It just doesn't right. make any sense. Like file a complaint if you want, but like canceling your subscription, like who do you think that's going to hurt? It's it, it's not going to hurt Tom Cotton. No, it's also it's making a very specific decision where you're saying I'm putting myself in the in the voice of one of these people. You're saying like I hate James Bennett, the op-ed page editor. I'm also going to reduce my entire view of the Times worthiness as an institution to whatever decision he makes, which First of all, the ratio of like New York Times columns that are uh, expressing Cotton's opinion and opinions like that versus the ones on the other side. What do you, th what do you think that ratio is? Nine to one, ten to oh one? Oh, my God. Yes. I mean, you have there are you have columns on like a semi-regular basis about things like serious columns about things like abolishing the police. Right. Yeah. But but here's here's how this kind of discourse works, where it's a series of escalating claims where like. Just tell, I'll, I'll say one of these claims and you tell me if you agree, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Cotton's column might not have been a good use of Time's editorial space. Agree. Tom Cotton's column might have overestimated the extent of the violence or not put it in the proper context. Agree. Tom Cotton's column is an imminent threat to the lives of black journalists. <laughs> But you see what I mean? Like there, there, there's, there's this little iceberg of disagreement at the top. It's a leap. Yeah, right. yeah, and we all right. agree on all this other stuff. But, but all the online focus, because of the the way online discourse works, is now this is what we're arguing about. It was similar with the Amy Cooper thing, where the the discourse really focused in on what exactly was in her brain, and did she literally want to get Christian Cooper killed? And this isn't good because it's just it's designed to sort of split people and put people in difficult decisions and i think a lot of like time journalists felt pressure to just tweet stuff i frankly don't think they believe i mean if they want to lay out what they mean when they say one column is gonna it's also it's just a little solipsistic like the idea that it's it's totally solipsistic and narcissistic absolutely the the times op-ed page it is so important and such a hollowed ground that you know, cops are going to see it and they'll start to kill protesters. I mean, what? Right. Like he can unilaterally like, like send the National Guard into these cities that or these states that don't want them. He, he can't actually do that. Tom Cotton, Cotton is a sitting senator. He has power, but he does not have that power. And, you know, 
I agree that this is maybe not the best use of space in the times, although it like ran online, which is basically infinite space. But right. the reason I don't get pissed when I see things that disturb me in the times or in any other paper is because I think people need to be aware of what others, especially people in power, think. And I'm going to go ahead and guess that a lot of New York Times readers would not go to you know, uh, Washington Examiner or Breitbart or wherever Tom Cotton could get this published. So to me, it actually does provide a service to put this in a place where the liberals, the mostly like urban liberals who read the New York Times can see this, you know, and yes, they can like go to Tom Cotton's Twitter, or like watch C-SPAN or whatever to find out what he's saying in Congress. But this puts it in front of their face. And I think people need to be aware of this. And because of our echo chambers, because of our media bubbles, it's increasingly difficult to get any sort of, you know, uh, deferring opinion across your timeline. And so I don't really have a problem with the Times publishing this because I want to know what Tom Cotton is saying. I do. And and I'm not going to go to the fucking Federalist to seek it out. So this is like in my feed. I finally see it. Yeah. You know what my main problem with this is? Exotic cars. Exotic cars. Also, this that was online space they could have used to better inform people about the danger of British turfs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That is the sort of thing that they like. Come on. That's the sort of thing that they publish on a regular basis. <laughs> Honestly, like the the ratio of columns about British radical feminists versus any number of other issues. Yeah. I there's an element of this that makes me sad because you know they're. Um, like, you know, Wesley Lowry is a really good journalist and he did pioneering work. He worked on the Washington Post, completely valuable police shootings database that I've used to try to better understand the issue in recent days. And, and you know, he's saying he's going to cancel a subscription. And I, I wish there was some way for there to be for it to be possible. There was just disagreement here between people where no one's evil. But the problem is when you say that they, they sort of shift it. So they say, oh, so you're disagreeing about whether fascism is good. And they have all these like derailing tactics and sort of, I'm not talking about Lowry here, I'm talking about people in general. Um, just they have all these ways of making the debate not about what it's actually about. So they'll, they'll make a claim that this kills journalists. And then you say, I don't think it'll kill journalists. And then they say, oh, so you think fascists should have a platform? It's like, it, it just gets abstracted and caricatured in this way, which again is like what what college students do, not what grown adults arguing over specific words on a specific page should be able to do. Matt Iglesias from Vox posted something on Twitter today about how um, how he like has finally realized that for years when when contrarians and centrists and, and anti anti woke scolds were saying things like uh, this is not going this culture, this cancel culture, safetyism, all of this sort of woke bullshit is not going to say on campus like he finally like, oh, you might have a point. And then, of course, he got totally dragged for that. That reminded me of, of a story I was telling you off air about uh, about Jonathan Haidt. So Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist. He co-authored um, The Coddling of the American Mind with Greg Lukianoff. He's one of these guys. He's also an accomplished social psychologist who, who did really important stuff on moral foundations theory, basically why conservatives and liberals and others disagree. He's done a lot of stuff. He's like an important public intellectual. What he's controversial for is arguing that some of the stuff going on on campuses a is bad and be like you know actually poses some level of threat to sort of liberal ideas or civic discourse or or what have you and right he wrote a uh, he wrote a piece in i believe the atlantic in like 2015 or 2014 about like trigger warnings and he was i think it was one of the first sort of major um major publications to write about that and why trigger warnings are problematic and not problematic because like they're annoying problematic because they like make people less resilient. Yeah, that, I'm trying to remember the timeline. You definitely wrote about that. And there's at, there's at the very least evidence showing that trigger warnings don't help. I think it's like a little fuzzy, but yeah, trigger warnings, uh, you know, the whole safe space, anti-PC discourse, which I think had actually maybe died down a little in the last year or two. Um, but yeah, but so so the last, this time thing made me remember, like uh, when I was at New York Magazine, we got lunch in maybe... I want to say 2015 or 2016. And I vividly remember telling him that while I thought he made some good points, I overall, I disagreed with him because I thought a lot of this was just campus craziness. And you zoom in on college campuses at any point in history. And there's always this like performative activist bullshit. There's always radicals trying to out radical one another. 
And I, I remember saying like, it would be cool if we could do some kind of bet where we could like put something on the line, money for charity or whatever, and see who was right. See if he was right that this stuff, you know, was actually going to have an impact as these kids move into the real world. Or if I was right, that it was going to fizzle out. And me being me, I never actually followed up, but I remember thinking like, it would be cool to actually set terms. We could each put money online for charity or whatever. I wish part of me wishes we'd done that because it would have been important to like stake out that disagreement. I would have lost because like the, the, oh, yes. the time stuff is exactly that. It's exactly the, not, we can't publish this column because I disagree with its conclusions. We can't publish this column because it's endangering lives. This very heightened language of threat that is designed to like forestall any disagreement or any discussion. And you and I have both encountered that in other outlets too, either first or second hand. And it's absolutely seeping into journalism. It is. you know, And I think there's some really interesting parallels here with this idea that, you know, words are violence. The world is incredibly unsafe. So this is something that you see, you see both on the left and the right, but in the context of what we're speaking about. So this idea that Tom Cotton's column is going to get black journalists killed. I think that's sort of the same attitude that leads cops to be trigger happy. This idea that that there, that everybody has a gun, you know, everything's a weapon. And obviously they're on like, you know, one results in people dying and one probably won't. Um, so like, I'm not trying to say that these are equivalent, but there is this, or you see this on Twitter all the time. You know, every t- a woman says like, every time I leave my house, I have to t- keep my keys in my fist because I'm going to get raped. This, this idea that there's a, that there's sort of a monster on every corner. Yeah. And it, it, it's really pervasive. And I, don't think that it holds up to scrutiny when you look at sort of the course of the world over the past decades and centuries, you know, and this is a, sort of the, the, the pinker view of the world, which is that things are actually getting better, but people yeah. have this idea that things are getting worse and worse and worse. And right now, honestly, it does feel like things are getting fucking worse. Sorry to Jesse Stad for saying that, but Sorry, things are Jeff. fucking worse. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, so it's interesting. One of the, one of the, sort of most eloquent left-wing critics of this idea is Sarah Schulman. <laughs> I've cited this book so many times. I've read the first third of it, which I loved, but it's like, it's it's intellectually bankrupt of me to continue to recommend it to people when I have yet to read the second two thirds of it. But she wrote a book called Conflict is Not Abuse, Overstating Harm, Community Responsibility, and the Duty of Repair. And it makes a similar point to the one you make. She talks talks about how in dysfunctional lefty communities, any sort of disagreement is abuse. I'm abusing you. You're abusing me. And, and we've both seen this. It's like a truly toxic dynamic. And she explicitly connects that to things like um, Israeli soldiers' treatment of Palestinians, where they assume everyone's a terrorist. Again, I'm not going to get in this whole thing. Same as police, too. I don't want to get into the debates over exactly how much threat these different people face. But the point is, when you start to treat everything as a life and death situation, when your level of vigilance is always at an 11, it distorts the way you view the world and it, it makes certain discussions impossible. People think that even saying that the world isn't as dangerous as we think, like other people would say, well, that's a sign of your privilege. You are privileged to think that. And I am. I am totally fucking privileged. I live in, you know, I have my own private island. I am incredibly fucking privileged. Uh, but it's still true. It's still true that the world is actually not that dangerous compared to how, it's, how it was in the past. Well, but, but it's also like... There's definitely something in the idea that if like I live I live a safe life and in terms of my anecdotal stories about crime or threats in the world, I need to understand other people have different experiences. Absolutely. But at a certain point, you need to draw on like actual statistical evidence and stuff like that. It can't it can't be privilege and subjectivity all the way down. And like, you know, this is a the the great awakening is an example of this. Like white liberals have gotten more liberal on questions of race than black Democrats are. And there are situations where where the woke white liberals in many outlets are making claims on behalf of of less privileged people that do not line up with what those people believe. And it's complicated because like if you're in a newsroom, if you're at Vox or BuzzFeed or whatever, you probably do have a lot of people of color colleagues as a white person um, who do agree with you on this stuff and, and have the more radical views, but they're not representative of the broader population. So you know, even even questions like whether the military should be deployed to pretend that, to ignore the fact that like a sizable percentage of the people who would likely most be affected by that don't really have a problem with it. And again, I'm setting aside some of the fuzziness in the polling, but that's that's just not treating people with dignity and humanity. Like it's not treating people as the complicated creatures they are. And so many elements of this discourse just 
people of color are sort of summoned into existence just to prove your point as a white person. Like you say, oh, this this is listen to people of color. well, who? There's there's vast disagreement. And and that was sort of what got me about the Times thing. It's like I you can't just like point to a handful of journals and say, well, they say they feel threatened and, and turn off your brain and not evaluate the claim more closely. That's not treating people like human beings. That's treating them either like like babies where like, yep, yep, good point, or like bosses that you can't disagree with. You know, there's this rhetoric that keeps coming up. It's, it's And this isn't new, but it's been um, especially lately. You know, this idea that you need to listen to people of color. You need to listen to people of color. Well, like, all right, here's – this is this is just an anecdote. This is not representative at all. It's just an anecdote. But – Yesterday I was looking at Facebook and my Facebook is, I would say, 90% white people. There's a lot of dialogue about what's going on right now, of course. Every every single post that I have seen has been unequivocally supportive of protesters, has been people talking about mutual aid and where to meet up. It's a lot of people going to protest. Um, fuck the police. A lot of all cops are bastards. Like That's sort of the rhetoric of my Facebook. Yesterday, for the first time, I saw a post that was pro-police and this woman that I know posted a little story about how she was in a she had an abusive boyfriend and she called the cops or somebody called the cops maybe and the police came and they saved her life and they treated her boyfriend um they like didn't abuse him they like saved they saved her essentially and they they didn't like harm this guy who was like beating her ass and she was black and like obviously she's not representative either nobody's representative but it's just like people say listen to people of color well this person of color is saying she supports the police you know and it's like they're, when they say listen to people of color, they're saying listen to the people of color who already believe what I believe. Don't listen to people like Coleman Hughes or John McWhorter or Glenn Lowry or Camille Foster, or these other people they've probably never heard of, but these other black thinkers who have a different perspective. No, it's tough. And, and you can't reduce any of these questions to like what majority opinion is, because sometimes majority opinion is wrong. But you can't have it both ways where you say like your opinion is supported by by, quote, people of color or marginalized people and then ignore the level of disagreement there. I, I just think all this stuff is maybe it's a conversation for another day. I try to separate out identity politics from identitarianism. To me, identity politics is like acknowledging that certain groups um, have have collective interests and have been harmed in certain ways. Like I have no problem with someone saying black Americans should be described as their own group that has, you know, certain concerns unique to them or more a applicable to them. I think that's fine. I'm also Jewish. We we have identity politics. We needed them until recently just to be admitted to universities, recently meaning a few generations ago. Identitarianism is different and more radical. It's it's this idea that of really reducing people to just their identity and, and summoning them into existence as a concept just to like sort of point and see like, see, they agree with me. The blacks agree with me. And in many cases, it tips right to the line of actual benevolent racism, which is the concept any race theorist is familiar with. It's just, you see white people, white liberals in particular online making claims that just are bizarre, just sweeping claims about what black people as a, a monolithic block do or don't want. And, you know, I'm like you, I don't have a particularly diverse circle of friends, but a lot of this comes across like these people have never interacted with like an actual person of color, to be honest. I'm sure that you saw this. You might have, I might have actually seen this from your Twitter, but there was some, some like Instagram, uh, diversity trainer or something like that was like urging white people to just like Venmo black people $5. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, you know, if, if, if there's a black person and you want to support them, but you're not close enough friends with them to like send them a text of support, just send them five dollars. Like, can you imagine if if someone I graduated uh, grad school with, uh, whatever it was, six years ago now, seven years ago, uh, like a, a a black guy from grad school who I had not talked to since, I just Venmo him five dollars because racism. How demeaning and condescending that would be. Like these people live exi exist in a different universe when they think that's how people should interact with one another. You know, I've been trying to. So with Venmo, you can't like. There's like a memo thing, and you ha it's like required. You can't just like send people money. You have to like put some emoji in there. You can't do it. Can't do text. It has to be emoji. I'm pretty sure. And I've been trying to think of like what the particular emoji combination would be. That's like, hey, haven't talked to you since high school, but here's five bucks. You're black. Here's five bucks. It's like a uh, like if you could do like a little black power fist and then frowny face, frowny face, frowny yeah. face. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, that's that's what, what what we're supposed to do as good good woke white people, apparently. Oh man, should we um move on to the other Times article we wanted to discuss, or, or did you have anything more on this? No, let's put this one to bed. Let's kill this one. <laughs> let's call it. Let's call on the military to murder this subject. 
I actually did. Okay. Actually, wait, there is one thing I wanted to say. This image of cops, like, fucking beating people down because they're being yelled at that also shows me that cops have something in common with these like woke new york times writers which is that they also think that words are violence yeah no that's a good point because especially in the kansas city video like the fucking the reaction to this angry but mild criticism um i just think like this is like a useful tool for figuring out who shouldn't be a cop who should just be fired like if, mm-hmm. if you cannot deal with a protester yelling at you a little bit, this is such a bad field for you. Just get out. I also feel like that is true of journalists. If you cannot handle people yelling at you, you should also get out. On Twitter, especially. On Twitter. On Twitter, especially. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the only type of yelling that happens with journalists is on Twitter for the most part. Except if you go to like a fucking MAGA rally. I mean that completely unironically. If you as a journalist find your views or your coverage being swayed by what gabagoo 69 says on twitter like get the fuck out there's so much there's such a premium on jobs right now and so many talented journalists have been fired like we don't need like sort of this kind of pathetic little sniveling it's just get out there's so many people like this in journalism now and it's not that's not what it means to be a journalist i'm sure that they all think they're like speaking truth to power or whatever but what they're doing is like rolling the fuck over and letting other people to determine their opinions. It's- Actually, not to further digress, but the power thing is really interesting at a place like the New York Times because like, okay, it's a group of staffers who in theory are in the middle of the power structure. Like in theory, setting aside guild or union stuff, you know, they're they're breaking company policy by tweeting their critiques, blah, blah, blah. They could be fired or, or reprimanded. In reality, there is no chance any of them like they, they actually do have power and maybe it's an example of like worker power and we should celebrate it in the abstract. But I did see some people like pretending that this was particularly risky or that they were like facing some threat. But I, I can't think of any recent instance in which there's been one of these employee insurrections and anyone's gotten like fired or reprimanded over it. There is no fucking way any reporter would be fired for this tweet in part because it will just be a PR nightmare for the times. And yeah, like I was having a conversation about this with a journalist yesterday or a former journalist yesterday who said like, you know, these people should all be fired. Like in any other industry, if you, if you publicly criticize your boss like this, you would get, you would get fired. And I think that's, that's true with probably the exception of like um, academia, where if you have, you know, if you have tenure or if you have, you know, basically the First Amendment, if you work in a public institution, um, you have some more protection, which I think is good. And I want to say, like, I don't think it took like particular bravery for people for these people to, to like release this tweet. But in the abstract, I do think it's good for for reporters to to be able to publicly criticize their employer in this case in this case it's a little bit too like group thinky for me and i don't think it's totally thought out and i also think like they're really catastrophizing over like some words on a paper that actually don't have the ability to kill anybody or to send in troops anywhere um but uh, you know in sort of in theory you know i, I don't want to like I don't want to pretend that there isn't something important about people being able to publicly criticize their employer because there is. I agree. I also think it's important for the employer to say, I've heard your criticisms, but we think there's something more at stake here, which is totally. more or less what happened. Like James Bennett had his own sort of newslettery editorial today. And, and he actually, he addressed the substantive points way more than he addressed the idea that he was putting journalists' lives at risk, which I think is correct because I think it's silly. I, I don't think anyone's life was put at risk. So I don't know, maybe at the end of the day, this, this, it could be simultaneously true that certain elements of these systems work the way they should and that the trajectory point, <laughs> points in a pessimistic uh, direction for the use and me's of the world. Yes. The, and that's what really counts. Okay. Now that we've um, solved race relations, let's move on to the less uh, controversial and heated subject of youth gender dysphoria. <laughs> oh, wow. This is going to be a, this is going to be very fun. I think we could probably keep this segment fairly short, but it's just something that keeps coming up, and I want to I want to make this point. Times article from June first: the hardest part of having a non-binary kid is other people. It's written by Sandy Jorgensen. Sandy is the father of a seven-year-old who is non-binary. Obligatory photo of the kid, long hair. Because we assign gender to clothes, which is really dumb. You could say the kid is wearing both male and female clothing. It's 2020, and I can say that not a good sign. Right. I looked at the photo and I and I honestly couldn't tell if the kid was natal male or natal, natal female because kids are actually 
basically sexless or you know uh, once you put their clothes on they're basically sexless as long as like they have a medium length haircut yeah i feel like that quote you just said could be taken out of context and sound very creepy (laughs) some kids are sexy (laughs) what can i say (laughs) once you put their clothes on uh so this caught my eye because um obviously you and i have both written about uh trans stuff i've written a lot about youth gender dysphoria this fits very neatly in this subgenre of piece about particularly very young kids and how they come to realize they're trans and in a surprisingly high percentage of cases these stories involve some situation where the kid runs into gender norms at school kids don't accept that they're gender non-conforming and then the kid comes home talks to the parents and the conclusion everyone comes to is that they have the kid's sex and gender wrong This frustrates me for a number of reasons. I think for kids, gender norms can suck. If you're a seven-year-old who has long hair, which is the situation here, at one point, this kid was a seven-year-old boy who went to school. And while the article is vague about it, it seems like other students did not sit well with a boy with long hair. That was unusual to them. That was somehow wrong, which is a very regressive and conservative idea. This kid comes home, they talk about that, and they come to the... It's also anti-skateboarder. I would would like to point that out. (laughs) We need to protect that constituency in particular. Yeah, young punks. Now, I I don't want to, like, overstate this, because the kid had... There was some kind of gender stuff going on before, some kind of switching between non-binary and binary pronouns. It's very clear in this piece that part of what happened was the kid was treated poorly by other kids, and this leads mom to the conclusion that the kid is really non-binary. I have a lot of problems with this, and I just want to be clear about what they are. My, my problem is to not explore the possibility that the problem doesn't lie with the kid or the misunderstanding doesn't lie with the kid and the parents, but rather with these other dumber kids pisses me off. And there's a lot of stories like this where sometime at some point in the path of a kid realizing they're trans, you'll hear something like, well, you know, they were made fun of at school for being gender non-conforming. And I just want people to slow things down a little bit and and just acknowledge the possibility that this could influence the way a kid understands their own gender. And in much the same way we're talking about people catastrophizing and taking things out of context in the earlier segment, here's where people jump in and say, oh, so you want to give the kid conversion therapy? You want to force them to cut their hair? No, 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 no. Just like there has to be some point at which you really talk to these kids and try to understand what is making them feel insecure about being seen as male or female. This is really sort of textbook, uh, like what gender clinicians did. I've talked to a lot of gender clinicians, and the first thing they do is try to understand where the gender feelings are coming from. So to see outlets like The Times completely ignore that step, and this now happens over and over and over because we have this very essentialist view of youth gender identity where, like, you got to find the kid's true gender identity, which is down there, like, it's like it's in their belly somewhere. you got to dig down and find it as though there is this stable, immutable core. It's like a soul. Yeah, exactly. And And it's not a realistic understanding of how gender works, especially for young kids, and I... I just don't understand, like, uh, these pieces are always so devoid of any sort of developmental psychology. They're often also devoid of the voices of gender clinicians, except for this very small band of sort of celebrity ones who are of the, like, the belief that the kids always know who they are. But but kids don't always know who they are. Right. The particular uh, clinician um, uh, quoted in this piece, Diane, is it Eintracht? How do, how do you pronounce her name? Aaron Saft. So Diane Iron Traft, uh, Aaron Traft? Aaron Saft. Aaron Saft. Okay. Diane Aaron Saft. <laughs> Diane Aaron Saft. So she's, I believe she's based in the Bay. Is that correct? Or, or Yeah. I, 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 inter- I was in her apartment. I interviewed her for my Atlanta oh. story. So she's sort of famous because she, um, she's, there's some video that's been floating around where she says something about how like infants can, it can signal their gender identity. Like if a, if a baby girl takes the bow out of her hair, well, she's maybe might not be a girl. Um, and then this, this interesting thing, uh, a couple months ago, um, surface where it turns out that she also was a proponent of like multiple personality disorder or was it satanic panic do you remember this it was satanic panic yeah daycare panic okay so she was also a proponent of satanic panic this sort of mass hysteria that happened in the 80s and 90s where people were thinking that like this widespread and super super outlandish child abuse was happening all over america Thousands of people were arrested, at least hundreds, maybe thousands went to jail, like a super, like very fucked up period in American history. And she was a proponent of this. And now yeah, she's well, specifically, taken... she was a proponent of the idea that like kids had sort of infallible memory or knowledge of what happened to them. She was of the, the right. believe children ilk, which is her position now. 
Right. And then, so children would say things like somebody came into my bedroom and took me to a cave and made me eat babies and, and people would go to jail and she would say, believe the children. And she's doing the same thing, but just now with gender, there's a lot of overlap between these two, these two like weird panicky, panicky moments in American, uh, American culture. Um, yeah. And uh, another thing about the piece that we're talking about. So one thing I found a little bit different about this one is that the, the parent who wrote this piece makes it seem like the kid came to the conclusion to go by by they them independently like the kid had no influence no influence with the parents right the kid just like knew that there was this third pronoun i find that very hard to believe i find it hard and at, at six years old at six years old the kid decides i want to be you know the singular they i just find it fucking hard to believe i don't think that this would happen without of parental course. influence and, and that's fine like parents should have an influence on their child but if you like if you if you create this story where like my came like my six-year-old came home one day and decided that they were that they were they um i just like i'm very skeptical of that and i i actually do like i know uh, i think this kid is like nine now i know a um a, like a young kid who who goes by they well guess what their parents also go by they their parent is queer their parents all their parents friends go by they yeah. The kid didn't independently come up with this. It's they're they are surrounded by this narrative that they is an option. And I think it's it's tricky because like there's there's a subset of kids who have really intense gender dysphoria from like the time they can talk. These are sort of it's a well known subset of kids in the literature. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will always have gender dysphoria or, or be trans, but it's pretty different if a kid from like the time they're two is like they say things like God made a mistake by giving me a penis. It's like heartbreaking stuff, really deep seated. That's pretty different from a kid who like has an experience at school. And then I think you're right that there's some parental influence here, you know, is told, well, if you're in between boy and girl, you're not either, which is not something like a seven-year-old is going to have the developmental skills to really grapple with. And there's this element of just complete fuzziness. I mean, this one line blew me away. This is not a direct quote. This is paraphrasing. Children can and do know their gender identity, said Dr. Diane Aronsaf. And then it lists, what, is it, what does that mean to say you can and do? Like, do they or can they? Like, it doesn't mean anything. You seem to be saying sometimes. And I think that the elephant in the room, no one will acknowledge, is that a lot of the time, seven-year-olds don't have any idea what they're talking about. Um, and this is trying to make this into an easy thing where it's either you trust your seven-year-old who you wouldn't trust with anything else or you don't. And Look, none of this means you, you should absolutely listen to your kid and take their feedback, but these pieces are written in such an oversimplified way. Do you some so something I've been thinking about over the past couple months. So you know, gender identity was not a term I had probably heard until the last like five or ten years or whatever. I've known trans people for a lot longer than that, but the term gender identity itself um sort of entered the lexicon as far as I know. Or in the in the mainstream lexicon sort of fairly recently. And I've just sort of, you know, had just assumed that gender identity exists. Does it, you know, this idea that there is something inside you that tells you if you like pink or blue, it does, it's like, what organ does that come from? You know, is it like a brain thing? Is it a soul thing? Which I don't really believe in the soul. Um, I, you know, so I, I, we just accept that this thing exists. At the end of the day, if you have gender dysphoria, it in, can be incredibly distressing. And like, it's a reason people go on hormones or get surgery. So everyone agrees that whatever it is, it's not fun to have and, and that people need access to healthcare. But I think gender identity serves as a way of putting it more in line with being gay, where it's just like this, this thing, because being gay, it's just, it's not, it's an ill-suiting analogy because being gay doesn't cause you any distress unless people are cruel to you. Like inherently being attracted, you being attracted to women doesn't cause you any harm, but inherently depends on the woman. Feeling <laughs> Hey, uh, <laughs> Nanette over here. <laughs> is that the right? Is that even a right? I'm like Liz Lemon trying to make cultural references. Was that a correct reference? Nanette? I mean, yes, you're talking about that that quote unquote com com comedian. That that one lesbian. That one lesbian. Yeah. Um, I think gender identity is an understandable desire to take this thing that people would view as a pathology and make it um, similar to sexual orientation, they're not the same at all. Because if you have gender dysphoria, like it causes brutal distress in a way having a non-normative uh, sexual orientation doesn't. So anyway, I think I'm with you. Like maybe I'll, this would be a good thing for us to talk about at some point, but I'm, I'm of the mind that I don't, I don't think I have a gender identity. I don't know what it means. If I try to describe it, it's just 
stereotypes. Like, right. Does my male gender identity make me feel weird tearing up at a movie? Like what is it? If it's just the fact that I'm okay, like having a penis, that doesn't make sense to build an identity around not having problems with having a body part you have. That's not really an identity. Right. And I think there's a, all this stuff has changed in recent years, but you know, I think what would be sort of historically called transsexuals, you know, the issue was with the body. The body that I'm in is the wrong body, not necessarily the the gender role. Um, and, you know, so you go get hormones and surgery and you change your body and with it, your look or whatever. Um, but now the narrative has changed and you don't even have to, a lot, according to a lot of people, you don't even have to have gender dysphoria to be trans. It's not necessarily a problem right. with the body. Um it's yeah. something else. Uh, <laughs> we should, at some point, we'll, we'll talk more about all this. But yeah, I, I think people should think through what a gender identity means. I'll link to a couple pieces, one by this MIT philosopher that I found very compelling, just um, arguing that the concept is incoherent, which which is consequential because this concept is now written into a lot of laws around the U.S. And people... What happened with the uh, when the MIT professor wrote this? He got canceled subsequently for something else, uh, for writing a philosophy paper about the, and I'm saying beforehand, we're not getting into this now, Katie, so help me God. The, the <laughs> question of what a woman is, he wrote a paper uh -huh. on that that made people mad. This piece, strangely enough, if you write that you're skeptical of the concept of gender identity, people usually won't go after you, but that's partly because a lot of trans people themselves have problems. They think that is too reductive a concept. Mm -hmm. It is interesting how it's just accepted though. It exists. It's the soul. It exists. Well, it's the same like it's the good ally bullshit. Are you going to be the person in the room who stands up and is like, well, that doesn't make sense to me philosophically. Like who wants to be that asshole other than us? <laughs> other than us. <laughs> and I'll tell you, it is not a fun position to be in. <laughs> if I could, you know, I might not be able to change my, identi my gender identity, but if I could change my personality, I would absolutely do it. Oh, my God. If you could have surgery to fix your personality. Oh, my God. I would take those hormones. That's what top surgery really should be, getting a new brain. I was just like top, top surgery. It goes into your brain and just like carves it into something better. <laughs> That's what we should do with our Patreon money. Oh, my God. Those millions. We Yeah, we've, we have to figure out that. Um uh, yeah. So, okay. That's, that's just us lightly dipping a pinky toe into the qu question of gender identity, but we'll return to it. Did, um, before we sign off for our regular subscribers, did you have anything else you want to talk about? No. <laughs> just so, so just desolate, like, <laughs> God damn it. Oh, no, you're going to have to pay for more thoughts. Give people a one sentence preview of what we're about to discuss. Bullshit. We're going to discuss more bullshit. I would say, okay, we're going to discuss performative allyship in the time of, um, not Corona anymore, the time of, what are we calling this moment? The time, the time of the 2020 race riots? Performative allyship. It's a great subject. Thank you guys very much for listening. Definitely check out the Patreon if you're able. We're about to record it. I'm going to get a beer because it's 3.30 p.m. and I'm an adult and that means whatever I wanted to. Sorry, dad. Sorry, dad. Uh, <laughs> can you swear one more time for my dad? Fuck yes. <laughs> this is so fucking pure out. I love it. Uh, I can't believe we're starting to get paid for this. It's incredible. Okay. Uh, I have my beer. You have what I can only assume is something weed related. I do. And we are back for our Patreons. The Hello, Patreons. Hello, Patreons. You're. Uh... Hey, patrons. Uh, we, we misnamed you. I, th I like benefactors too. Sponsors. Johns are Johns. Barley Legal Teats. Block Term Portal Legal Our Barbaras. Um, okay. Thank you guys for uh, giving us money so you can listen to this, what is sure to be a very enlightening segment on Instagram and performative allyship. So earlier this week, um, in response to everything that's going on, um, a couple of women in the music industry, uh, Jamala Thomas and Brianna, I'm going to get her last name wrong, Agamang, um, they started a basically a new hashtag on Instagram and the hashtag was the show must be paused and I'm gonna I'm gonna read the initial post that they that they that they made this announcement on. Um so this is a black a like a a, a black uh, whatever a black like a black box a black box and in white text um it says 
Music Industry Blackout Tuesday. Due to recent events, please join us as we take an urgent step of action to provide accountability and change. As gatekeepers of the culture, it's our responsibility to not only come together to celebrate the wins, but also hold each other up during a loss. Join us on Tuesday, June 2nd, as a day to disconnect from work and reconnect with our community. Hashtag, the show must be paused. So this was posted on Instagram, and... Um, and I'm not sure entirely how this happened, but it sort of got very quickly bastardized. Like other people started started posting it, like Billie Eilish, that um, like very young musician. The Rolling Stones posted it. Quincy Quincy Jones posted it. But this quickly mutated and morphed as these things tend to happen on social media. And so different memes started popping up. And so like the one that kept uh, that kept coming up on my Instagram feed was basically telling. Um, telling people, white people in particular, to stop for like, for first it was one day and then it was one week. So it was like one day on June 2nd, uh, everybody like white people don't post to make room for people of color posting on social media. And then it was a week. So from like June 1st to June 7th, like white people don't post, just use your, use your, your platform to just amplify black voices, which I thought was kind of funny on like my particular Instagram feed, because my particular Instagram feed is probably like my Facebook feed, probably 90% white people. And so it was just like, is this just going to be like, for, is there going to be like no Instagram posts or it'll be like, <laughs> a, like zero Instagram posts from like my white like my like woke white friends and then uh and, and then like the people I went to high school with will just be like sharing pictures of their kids or whatever like they always do okay so so that started and then on so different sort of mutations happen lots of instructions go silent amplify black voices blah 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 and then so people started just posting instead of like not doing anything they they all started posting this black box so like when i went through my instagram feed the first one i saw i was like is this thing broken like like tap it like hello is anyone home and then it's just like black box after black box after black box so the entire fucking feed is just black boxes no content i will say as a user not super interesting um to go through your instagram feed and see <laughs> just a sea of black boxes but you know it's f for like what people think is a good cause um and then the funny thing about this is that people were like adding the hashtag on their post the, the black type the black lives matter hashtag and then it turned out that that was problematic because if you go to the black the black lives matter hashtag it was just a sea of empty posts so then there was a new meme that went by so then there's so all of these people posted these you know these black boxes and then after that there's this this wave of like corrections like all right guys uh you have to delete the you have to delete the black lives matter post and so people started like deleting the hashtag from their post and then there's a, a, a another wave and it's like wait wait you can't just delete it because if you delete it it's like stays in the algorithm and it'll still uh and it'll still show up and so you have to delete the post and put up a new post so it's just like people like instruct like in, and in my feed like mostly white people instructing other white people on like how to get, be good allies and a lot of these people like i went to your wedding denise it looked like a fucking kkk rally like i know like, like i know and i'm and i'm willing Will not pretend that I have like a very diverse friend group. I, I, which to my, you know, my excuse is that I don't have any friends, much less, much less black <laughs> friends. Okay, so then there's another wave of people then apologizing for, for posting the black box, and the so the whole thing is just like such. It's so it's like self flagellating, right. and it, and I get it. Like people really want to be a part of something they really do um and they really do and they don't know what else to do and some of these people are actually going to protest which i think is 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 not great because like i'm still concerned about the fact that we're in the midst of a pandemic and i know that like you're not supposed to say this but i wish that this could have just like waited until we had a vaccine i mean right now like in what in seattle UW, which is the big like one of the big hospital systems here they just furloughed 5500 employees from from the hospital system right there are tens of thousands of people marching in the street or thousands of people i don't know if there's tens of thousands in seattle but there are thousands of people marching in the street in seattle while the biggest hospital system just had to furlough 5500 people i'm not totally sure that there's going to be a spike in covid cases after this if i listen to what the public health experts were saying last month i would say yeah there's going to be a fucking spike after covid cases i was always a little bit skeptical of the public health experts we talked about this on one of our earlier episodes and i was saying something about how after watching the quote unquote vape crisis unroll when all of these public health experts were like really giving bad advice to people and like 
not just spreading inf- misinformation, but like actually making the vape crisis worse by outlawing, you know, like regulated and leg- legally purchased flavored vapes, um, like way right. back in 2019. So it was like hard for me to trust these people, these same people now in the midst of this crisis. And then now the same public health people are saying, you know, we stand with protesters. It's okay to protest. Like my wife is a nurse, you know, and she got a message from her union yesterday, a text from her union asking her to go protest this weekend. And she wrote back and she was like, I work with immune compromised patients. I find it very irresponsible that you're pressuring nurses to take part in this while we're in the midst of a, of a public health crisis. You know, so anyway, I'm a little that's bit. Cra- that's crazy. I mean, I, you would think like, I mean, maybe people have made that point, but like there's, there are actual trade-offs here and they should be, we should be able to discuss them. Right. Right. But instead it's like, if you don't, I mean, we talked about this in the last segment, this pressure to conform, you know, if you don't, if, if you don't show up at the protest, if you don't put up, put your, put up your black meme or whatever, then you're not a good ally. It's really fucking disturbing. Anyway. So there's this like wave of this, like first, so first there's the blackout Tuesday and then there's the, you know, black Tuesday 2.0 this time without the hashtag. And then there's the apologies for using it. And I, I read a, a piece this weekend by, um, by a friend of mine, this woman um, named Elena White, who lives in Seattle, and she she she's a writer. She does a bunch of other stuff, but she's a she's very smart. She's a, a heterodox thinker. And she wrote this great piece that we can link to in the show notes for KOW, which is the local um, public radio station in here. And she basically said, like, your memes don't help. Your po- your posts don't help. And she didn't say like, you, what you need to do is go out and protest. What she said is like, what you need to do is like, live your life so that you are actually come into contact with a more diverse group of people, you know, have black friends and don't go out and like find a black friend or like Venmo a black friend because right. you feel bad. Just like live your life so that you, you're surrounded by more diversity and also listen to more than just like the black people on your Twitter box, you know, listen to the black people in your neighborhood. If you live in a black people with your neighborhood, which most people, most white people probably don't. But I, I think her point was, was a really good one. You know, this Everything that's happening now is not going to be solved by posting memes, especially when you're just preaching to the choir. That's sort of the thing that I find so frustrating about this performative allyship is that it's just a bunch of people who are surrounded by people like them posting these memes as though it's going to change anybody's mind. And it's not. It's just not. I don't think the protests are going to change anybody's mind either. I think the protests, in fact, my fear is that the protests are going to have the opposite effect where, you know, like liberal white people are mostly, I think, on board with maybe not like, quote unquote, anti-racism. Maybe they don't know what that really means, but they they are not racist They're or they're not racist in sort of the way that we used to think of racism. You know, they're less racist. Their, their views on race are more progressive than their parents. Their parents were more progressive than their parents. Their parents were more progressive on their parents. It, you know, it's a slow journey, but like. Yeah, it, it's fucking happening. People are, are like getting getting woker um, on on racial shit. And that's good. But and my fear is that this is going to this is going to lead to the reelection of Donald Trump. And then my biggest fear is that there's going to be Donald Trump will get reelected because people don't like seeing cities being destroyed. They don't like seeing violence. They don't see, like seeing looting. For a lot of moderate people, they're probably more likely to side with the cops. And unfortunately, like we live in a country where. Moderates will oftentimes, you know, determine an election because the ele- because of the electoral college. Moderates are in these particular swing states. Those are the people who actually will determine the election, not the fucking like whether or not the Brooklyn DSA decides to sit out the election or write in Bernie Sanders. That doesn't really matter. Um, that's just the system that we have, and it's fucked up. But we have to work within that system. And if those people are turned off by these protests, by what they see as riots. And they vote for Donald Trump and Trump wins, wins again. That is going to prove unequivocally to every, to all of the like good liberals and the good white liberals and people of color that the United States is a, a country, is a white supremacist nation. It is intractably racist. It is, it is unsavable because Donald Trump will have won as a response to this. Not, I think, necessarily because people are actually hardened racist but because they don't like see cities being destroyed 
And that's just going to make shit so much worse. So I'm worried that he wins again, and that's when the real race white riots start. And I'm like, I'm trying not to be like too much of a pessimist when it comes to this stuff. But and I think, you know, there are so like some reasons to be optimistic. It seems like some legislative fixes have been proposed to address things like police violence. Um, But I'm not feeling too hopeful right now. I deleted my Instagram. That's that has been my response to this is deleting my Instagram. Out of solidarity, I never signed up for Instagram. That's good of you. I think I'm less con- concerned or I'm less convinced about how the unrest will play out. Cause I, I think there's just way too many variables. Um, and, you know, I don't know, you could see a driving turnout. You could see a depressing turnout. You could see white people in the suburbs freaking out. There's also a lot of white people in the suburbs who are sympathetic. You see them protesting. Sure. But I think they're, they weren't going to vote for Donald Trump in the first place. Right. I think that's true. I, um, I guess to me, just, I, I always want to like play the identitarian card when it comes to like white people in segregated communities who are like on in theory, very empathetic toward black people, but barely know any of them. Cause it's like, those are my people. I just want to like barrel into conversation and be like, this is my lived experience among white liberals. And we've talked about this before, but just the, the narcissistic and solipsistic mode of anti-racism, um, you know, this Instagram thing is a good example where like people really feel they're accomplishing something but it's mostly about signaling to others how anti-racist you are. Right. And that's where even if we're even if we're talking about like one off individual actions, which are not going to solve anything, but like I keep saying, like, donate to a bail fund, donate to a criminal reform organization. I think there's a reason people put a premium on this other stuff, like talking about Robin D'Angelo or talking about what like it's there's a brand in being a white person committed to anti-racism. And I don't think it's correlated with doing anything to improve the world. We have not seen like you know, the, the fucking pussy march or whatever, the women's march. Like we, we have had these moments where hundreds of thousands, millions of people show up on the street, but this isn't 1960. It doesn't seem to have any change on policy or on who's in power. That's the thing though. It's so hard to know. Like maybe the, maybe the women's march has led to the resounding victories in the 2018 elections, which were mostly driven by like moderate suburban types, like the kinds of people who are marching, not like far leftists. So yeah, you could be right about that, but I think there's different ways to look at it. I mean, I think what led to massive turnout, I think it's less likely it was the pussy march and just the fact that Donald Trump won and people were really shocked about it. Yeah, no, but it can, it can be both, right? Because like, so when, yeah. when the women's marches happened, what gave me hope was the idea that they're bringing people into politics for the first time. Like if you if you turn sure. a given 18-year-old into someone who's actually going to be canvassing and registering to vote, in the same way the Obama movement really brought people into politics, that's the stuff I find hopeful. I... Yeah, but you know, it's very hard to say. These are like sort of impossible political science and social science questions to answer. And I'm with you that people at the very least should not assume all oh, these protests now will have a good outcome. But at the same time, I understand why people are protesting. So it's it's really complicated. The um the, did you see the article in The Verge about the blackout thing? No, I didn't. This was kind of amazing. It's by a guy named James Vincent. Blackout Tuesday posts are drowning out vital information shared under the BLM hashtag. So this is sort of like the, the natural endpoint of any of these online pylons is to just like increasingly exaggerate the um, the status of the harm committed by the perpetrator, right? Right, right. So in this case, the theory is by tagging stuff with Black Lives Matter, you're making it harder for people to find information about protests, which is a very weird thing to say because this suggests that like organizers are very stupid. Like, so every people who aren't as online as us might not understand this, but like every second, a million people tweet black lives matter. It's gotta be one of the most popular hashtags. The idea that like local organizers in Baltimore are telling people, okay, so we're going to meet at the corner of whatever and whatever. If you lose the group, enter the hashtag black lives matter. And just, it makes it like, it's one of these articles where it's so obvious that, the outlet just wants to chime in on the right side of an issue and like bash the evil people who did this performative activism. But like it, you read two paragraphs of it and you're like, this doesn't make any sense. It's just performance. It's just performance. And maybe that's what people, all people feel that they can do. And I'm sure that some of these people are also donating and going to protests or whatever, but I wish that they would like just use their fucking brains a little bit more. And it's also like the reason I deleted Instagram is because this was actually making me dislike my own friends. Um, <laughs> And I don't, I, it, it really was. And I deleted Facebook too, because the same thing is happening. I kept Twitter. So, <laughs> so I, I don't know what that says about me. But so now when I'm like, 
I'm like scrolling on my phone and I like need a break from Twitter. What I've been doing is like like searching like Redfin. Redfin is like my new my new social network because I need to get away from Twitter, but I can't look at fucking Instagram because it's making me hate my own friends. The um the weird trajectory in my life is like I'd say most of my normie friends now, people who like barely even understand that like some people hate me on Twitter, who get like surprised by the stories I tell them, they increasingly have Instagram profiles there's a lot of just like normal people on there right oh my god yeah it's you should check it out sometime it's a very it's oh a god. it's a big social network I, I think it i don't know if it's actually i would say it's probably much bigger than twitter i mean twitter doesn't have that many people on it it's just people who talk a lot and who happen to have i think more cultural power in some ways i'm trying to think of what what circumstances would cause me to join instagram like so if isis kidnapped me and chain me to a radiator and said that I had to join Instagram or they would kill me. I'm not saying I wouldn't, but I would, I would have to think about it. I'd have to like take whatever the full amount yeah. of time they gave me to think about it, to be sure. I mean, the, un the unfortunate thing is that aside from these like political moments, and this would happen if there had been, you know, uh, you know, like after, after there was a, the, the, the terrorist attack on Paris, you know, and everybody changed their Facebook avatar to like a layover with the, with the French flag or after gay marriage passed and everybody changed their Facebook profile to a you know a layover of the of the gay pride flag like it's totally fucking meaningless it's the definition of slacktivism it's just purely signaling i'm not sure why signaling annoys me as much as it does but it fucking drives me crazy well because well, you probably um, associate yeah. it with annoying people like okay after the paris terrorist attack i'm sure that at a certain point i was like this doesn't do anything but i also you can understand why people want to show their solidarity and just like feel like they're doing their small part i can but i also like everybody not everybody, but a lot of people take it as uh, as a re like an occasion to remind everybody that they studied abroad in Paris when they were tw like 22 or whatever. It just becomes this exercise of narcissism where it feels like people are doing it for the likes. I mean, which is a huge reason why I'm on social right. media in the first place is to get this validation. But I just don't like the idea that you're getting validation through this sort of faux activism. Yeah, I'm with you. It doesn't really... It doesn't do anything. And I wish like I had better information on what percentage of like white anti-liberals are actually doing anything other than reading certain books. I mean, Robin D'Angelo's book was number one on Amazon. So oh it's, my God, right? Ugh. It's a very big deal. Jesus Christ. Well, she's certainly doing well in the, well in the riots. Maybe people should start looting bookstores and stealing her book. <laughs> oh man. Was there, do have we covered everything that should be covered in this? Is there a name for this particular controversy? Like black, blackstagram, Instagram, black. <laughs> I think the name is hashtag black lives matter. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is, this is ultimately, this is a, a minor thing, but minor things are um, what I really want to talk about right now because everything else is too fucking overwhelming. No, this is a rich and juicy morsel because it like it's, it brings together so right. many horrible, annoying people, but people who are desperately trying to show that they're great. We should start a blocked and reported Instagram, but we'll call it blacked and reported, and it's just black squares. <laughs> this reminds me, you don't watch Thirty Rock, right? I yes, I do watch Thirty Rock. Thirty okay. Rock is the one comedy that I actually like. Tracy Jordan is talking about the the black exploitation films he was in, and one of them was a bluff fair to remember black. <laughs> hey, can you tell the story about your meeting of Tracy Morgan? I, I feel like our patrons deserve to hear this. Oh man, that it was like this was maybe three months ago, but it feels like eight years ago. I cannot tell the story as of yet because nothing like that crazy happened, but it just involves people I'm not sure want to be named. Just it was like a, a thing at a restaurant, but. I will check and I will try to tell this on a later occasion. This is what it's called a teaser, right? In the industry, in the biz. Yes. And uh, I will, I will, I will assure you folks, I have heard the story and it is worth listening to. It is worth paying more just to hear this. It is worth telling your friends to pay. Yeah. We're introducing a new hundred dollar tier if you want to hear the Tracy Morgan story. Or somebody can just Venmo me, Venmo me a hundred bucks and I'll tell it without Jesse's permission. That works too. If you Venmo, if you Venmo me ninety nine, I'll tell it. <laughs> Damn it! You're always undercutting me. Okay, so I think that's a that's about it. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much for for subscribing. This has been blocked and reported. I'm Jesse Single, and remember, the National Guard should occupy this podcast until we can figure out what the hell is going on. I'm Katie Herzog, and also remember, this podcast is gonna get journalists killed. <laughs>